Today, we celebrate the fact that we are Easter people, that God is alive and well and working in the world around us, and that we have a front row seat to the miraculous things God is doing in and through us, if only we have eyes to see it. My name is Ren Serna. I'm the senior pastor here at University Presbyterian Church, and I want to welcome you to worship this day. In our service today, we will be sharing some inspiring music, offering a time of prayer, hearing from God's word, and my hope and prayer is it is an encouragement to you wherever you find yourself this day as you seek to draw closer to Jesus and grow closer to community with one another. As we settle into this time, I invite you to settle your mind and your body and your spirit as much as you're able to with whatever this day looks for you. And I invite you now to join me in prayer. God, give us eyes to see how you are at work in this world. We thank you for this time where we can focus our energy and our attention on you and on the community that you are building in and through us. Bless us and meet us however we come today. In your name we pray. Amen. Greetings, friends. I want to add my welcome to you this day as we are in worship together. If you are a guest with us, we extend a very warm welcome to you, and we hope and pray that you will find a family here with us at University Presbyterian Church. And if you feel comfortable, we would encourage you to fill out our connections card at upcfresno.org forward slash connect so that we can reach out to you and let you know of some announcements and exciting events that are coming up in our life as a community and incorporate you into that life and, and offer a warm welcome to you. So indeed, encourage you to uh, fill that out if you feel so comfortable. We do have an announcement just to remind you of some good news coming up. April 25th at 11 a.m. we will have our next outdoor service. This will be a fun service as we get to witness and participate in some baptisms and especially because we get to be together um, out on the lawn and together as a church family. And we also just want to remind you that the session, our leadership team is continuing to evaluate and pray for and consider the ways in which God is moving us into this new transition. We know that there are a lot of announcements coming out from the state and from the county about reopenings and gatherings and what that may look like. And we want to assure you that the session is prayerfully considering what it looks like for us as a community of faith. And just keep an eye out for what we will be looking forward to doing together and how we will be gathering once again in the future. And now, friends, as we gather in this space, in this time, we turn our hearts to the Lord as we hear a message of hope from Pastor Wren. It's funny how quickly the joy of Easter fades. That feeling of the swell of music, the excitement of being together and waiting by the empty tomb, smiles shared across the dinner table. Maybe it's just the way the world has been this year. Online worship just doesn't grab us in the same way as an in-person Easter service might. Or maybe it's just the pace at which life is moving these days. There's no time to dwell on all that is lovely and good in this world. Either way, it's hard to believe that Easter was just two weeks ago and that according to the Christian calendar, we are still in the Easter season. I wonder too if it's hard to hold on to that joy of Easter because Easter maybe feels just a little too good to be true. And so it's easier to downplay the good news of Easter morning rather than get our hopes up. Or we distance ourselves from Easter a little bit. We see Easter as a historic event, a, a moment in time that happened a long time ago, rather than an accurate description of how our world works today. This idea of the resurrection, life coming out of death, is something we often associate with a historic event, or maybe we think of as an event that's yet to come, but will come many, many generations after we die. But this idea of the resurrection now, new life emerging from the pain and the hardship that you and I experience on a daily basis, 
There's no way for me to wrap my head around that. And I think really there are just too many reminders of the pain and the suffering in the world around us to hold on to that promise of Easter morning for more than just a little while before it starts to slip away. We see this in the pain and division in our families or our country, which is still wrestling to figure out how to come together in spite our differences. We see it when loved ones get sick or when our bodies begin to fail us. There are so many signs that we see every day of the world falling apart, that it's hard to hold on to this promise of life in the midst of death. And so I think it's easier to throw a big party once a year and to celebrate Easter, whatever that happens to mean, because it's just too difficult to believe that God is still at work making all things new around us. This idea of life out of death was such an improbable claim that even Jesus's closest friends struggled to believe it. Those who knew and loved Jesus best, those who should have known better, even they could hardly wrap their heads around the idea of the resurrection. So much so that when the woman encountered the empty tomb and heard the news that Jesus had risen and gone and told the disciples, the men dismissed them. They said it was idle chatter, or more accurately, they called them delirious. And then Cleopas and his friend were walking on the road to Emmaus, and they encountered the risen Christ in the flesh, and they walked with Jesus, and they talked with Jesus, and they ate with Jesus. And in that moment, they realized everything Jesus had ever said about the way the world works and of God's love for all of creation was true. And so they ran and told the disciples, what they had learned and discovered and the truth of the, the, empty truth, the empty tomb, the good news of the resurrection. And yet the disciples didn't believe them either. It wasn't until they saw Jesus with their own eyes, touched his body, shared a meal together, that they were slowly convinced of the power of Easter and saw the good news of God's love alive and well. I want to share with you this story of Jesus's miraculous appearance after he rose from the dead to invite you to listen in on how the disciples responded to this miraculous event. So hear God's word with us today from the Gospel of Luke. The author writes, Jesus himself stood among the disciples and said to them, peace be with you. There were many that were startled and terrified, and though they thought they were seeing a ghost. And so Jesus said to them, why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your heart? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. He said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. And then Jesus said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer to rise from the dead on the third day, and that the repentance and the forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my father promised, so stay here in this city until you have been clothed with the power on high. Amen. This story has quite the dramatic flair to it. The disciples were sitting around talking, no doubt grieving their friend's death, wondering what happened to his body, when suddenly Jesus appeared right there in their midst. 
The disciples were understandably frightened, just as any of us would be frightened if a dead loved one appeared in our living rooms. And seeing Jesus standing before them wasn't enough to convince them of the resurrection. And so Jesus offers up his physical body as proof, and he holds out his hands and invites them to touch him, to see the marks where the nails were, to feel his warmth, to feel his heartbeat, to know that they weren't imagining things. The author doesn't tell us if any of the disciples took Jesus up on this offer, but I bet some of his braver friends did, and yet they still were not convinced. The author says that in their joy, they were still disbelieving, still wondering if the news of the resurrection was too good to be true. It's striking to me how often joy and disbelief coexist. When we're hoping against hope for our deepest dreams to come true, while still holding back in reservation, worrying that maybe what we see before us is too good to be true. Makes me think of the first time I held my son, a child I had longed for, for so long, a child born out of my sweat and tears. How wonderful a gift to hold him in my very arms. And yet how very terrifying it is to be entrusted with something so precious and wondering if we could ever be worthy of such a gift. So often in life, joy and disbelief go hand in hand. And one does not negate the other. And it's true with faith as well that we, like the disciples, can be overcome by the realm of God while still not quite believing that God's plan for goodness and wholeness in life could really be true. I want to tell you that there should be no guilt with your disbelief, no hesitation in pushing back against your faith, of asking God the hard questions, seeking real concrete answers to the things that weigh heaviest upon you. Our scripture today reminds us that faith and disbelief can go hand in hand and that it is okay to allow those two feelings and emotions to coexist within you. When we see today that faith is so much more than an intellectual knowledge about God, but that we, like the disciples, need to have an encounter with Jesus that allows us to feel and to experience the love of God in a real and tan, concrete way. And that it's this experience with God that helps still our doubts and bring forth our joy. That it's not enough to just learn about God and to know facts about God but that we need to experience the resurrection firsthand in order to fully trust in the joy that is being offered to us. Jesus knew this to be true, that even his closest friends would doubt, that even his closest friends would need proof of the miraculous gift God had offered them. And so when seeing them, seeing Jesus with their own eyes wasn't enough, or hearing his voice or touching his hands didn't convince them, Jesus invited them to a meal. He ate with them. And in doing so, he offered proof that he was indeed real and in front of them. Because of course we know that ghosts can't eat but more than just offering proof, Jesus extended a sign of his love and commitment to his friends. He sat and shared a meal and spoke with them and listened to them and went through life with them. Time and time again throughout the Bible, we see Jesus sharing a meal with an unsuspecting, person. Whether Jesus chooses to break bread with the outcast or the sinner or the poor and hungry, Jesus gives a tangible sign of God's grace and acceptance 
by breaking bread with one another. And on our scripture today, once again, Jesus shares a meal for the last time with his closest friends, an act of everyday intimacy, a physical sign of God's presence and love, something tangible that they could hold on to when their doubts started to creep in again. And in this meal, Jesus' friends finally recognized him. And they come to believe in the power of the resurrection, that we, like Jesus, are blessed, broken, and shared. That we are invited to come and to experience God's love personally, intimately, deeply in our lives. And that the pains and the shortcomings that we feel can be transformed in light of the empty tomb. And we are called to know this love and to experience this grace intimately, and then to turn around and to share that love with the world around us. This is indeed what it means to be called Easter people, to believe in the love of God in spite of the challenges before us, and to allow that joy to guide us in spite of our disbelief. Some weeks this is harder than others, and Jesus knew that to be true, and he doesn't hold our doubt against us. And yet still we are called to witness to the power of God's love. Jesus tells his disciples, as he tells us today, we are witnesses to the great things God is doing in and through us. We are witnesses, just as we are. People look at our imperfect, doubtful, sometimes timid lives and see that we stand freely with God and proclaim the good things God is doing in joy and in pain. Thankfully, we don't have to do this work alone that we are called to stand in community with one another, to be the church together with our brothers and sisters, to celebrate one another's joys, to carry one another in our disbelief. This, my friends, is what it means to proclaim the good news that Jesus is risen and to live into the call to be Easter people. Friends, this table is a remembrance of the great things God can do from something that is broken, that God can take a broken piece of bread and make it beautiful, that God can take a dormant seed and grow something magnificent out of it, that God could take a life given for the sake of others and transform it into hope for the world. We indeed are living in miraculous times, and this table is a remembrance of the fact that we are indeed Easter people and that God is still at work. It's why on the night Jesus was to be betrayed to death, he gathered his friends around a table like this and took a loaf of bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he says, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took a cup of the fruit of the vine and gave thanks. And he says, this is my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, whenever we gather around symbols of brokenness with fellow followers of Jesus, we proclaim the truth that death does not have the final word, and that God is coming again. And so God, in this moment, we pray for your presence, that you would fill us in a miraculous way, that you would do the hard work of transforming our hearts and our minds and our bodies and our souls, so that we might be a sign to the world of your goodness here and now. We thank you for the opportunity to gather to celebrate and be together. We thank you for the gift of your son. Amen. 
Friends, I invite you now to celebrate in the gift of communion. You can do that by eating and drinking whatever you happen to have with you, or you can simply meditate and pause in this moment and remember God's great love for you and to give thanks for the gift of God's love in your life today. And so take, eat, taste, and see that the Lord is good and know that God is still working in this moment.
we continue in our worship through the act of prayer, knowing that when we come before God, lifting our hearts to him, that God is there. God is present through the power and the working of the Holy Spirit. So let us with confidence and faith come before God, lifting our prayers to God. Let us pray. Gracious and holy Lord, we come to you today offering our prayers of praise and thanksgiving, even as we come lifting our prayers for ourselves and others. We praise you for the hope that we are beginning to experience as we anticipate life in our communities opening back up and for the eventual opportunities to gather with friends and family alike safely and cautiously. We praise you for the faithfulness of so many as they have done their best to practice social distancing and to give care and concern for one another by wearing masks, by being safe, and by saying no to gatherings. We thank you for those who have been on the forefront of helping our communities, researchers that work tirelessly to find vaccines for us, for teachers who have showed up on Zoom regardless of their own exhaustion, for those who have refrained from large gatherings so that we can now gather, for essential workers in our stores, doctor's offices, cleaning crews, administrative staff, all who have faithfully supported all levels of essential services for us. We give you thanks and praise for their time and their commitment, even at a great risk to themselves at times. We also pray, Lord, for those in our communities who are cautious and are uncomfortable in gatherings. We pray that they would know that their decisions are valued and honored and respected. We also pray for our communities as they open up, that we would be mindful and cautious and continue to take safety precautions so that all might feel comfortable and welcome and see a hopeful future. And we pray for our nation, O oh Lord, and we ask for healing, not only from the pandemic, from racial injustice, for communities torn apart by violence, for our black brothers and sisters and people of color who are living in fear in our country, who are not treated equally or with justice. We pray that you would move our hearts that we might see our own prejudices and privilege and seek to learn and grow and change, that we might become better advocates for justice and peace for all. We confess that we have too often said that the problem is somewhere else, not here, or that it isn't me or my responsibility, or I am just one person, I can't do anything, and therefore take no action or steps at all. Forgive us, Lord, for our complacency. Forgive us, Lord, when our inaction contributes to the problems instead of helping others. Forgive us for our apathy when we should engage. Help us, Lord, to not see another news story and dismiss it. Rather, inspire us to ask the question how we can be agents of change. Lord, we know that there is also so much in our world and in our communities that at times it can become overwhelming. So reveal to us how we might be change makers in this space with the gifts that we have been given. Lord, we also know that there are many things that weigh on our hearts and our minds, but we trust that in all things you hear them, even sometimes before we speak them out loud. So we offer our prayers to you, even as we offer the prayer you taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. There is a wonderful passage in scripture that shares a story about the widow. A widow who comes into the temple and brings just one small coin. She gets chastised by the religious elite and those who have given more to the temple. But Jesus turns to them and says, her gift is the mightiest gift. Why? Because it came from her very heart, her very soul. 
She gave out of what little she had because her heart was thankful for whatever reason. We don't even know why. We just know that she comes to the temple and gives out of all that she has, her heart, her life, because of what she believed in. Friends, when we come to a time of offering in our service, in a sense, this is what we are called to participate in. It's not about how big our gift is or how little our gift is. It is about our heart. We give out of our heart, out of the graciousness and gratitude that we have been given from God. And in response to that, we give to the work of God. We thank you for your generosity throughout this past year, for your hearts and the ways in which you have given to the work and the ministry of Christ in this place. And we invite you to continue to prayerfully consider the ways in which you can support the ministry here at UPC and how you can be a blessing to the greater community here in Fresno. If you are a guest with us, don't worry about this. This isn't about uh, an ask for you. This is really just an opportunity for the members or people who call UPC home to give. So if you feel called to give today, we encourage you to go to our website at upcfresno.org forward slash give and give a gift simply out of your heart. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, I hope this service was a blessing to you today. Would love the opportunity to connect with you, to pray with you. Please reach out and connect if there's any way we can be in service to you this day. And I can't wait to see you soon. As we go from this place, receive the blessing of God. When everything good begins to feel out of reach, when collective change seems impossible, our hope is simply too hard. Christ whispers, peace, peace be among us, not to dull our need to feel sorrow or to quell necessary conflict, but to remind us again of what is so easily forgotten. Evil has not overtaken us. Love is still alive. God is potential, always within us. With this peace that sustains my dear friends, Go with confidence of God's love for you and for our world. Amen.